and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McMenamin and in this show, Lucky talks to us in construction. Our panel continues with part two of mindset, success and branding. But first, Michelle talks to Dawn, who is a nurse that become a buyer's advocate. We have an amazing guest, Dawn Fuhi, also a fellow buyer's advocate and also a registered nurse. Many hats you have. I've been so excited to have you on the show because you have an incredible story, incredible journey on how you became a buyer's advocate. And yeah, we'd just love to hear a little bit about it. How did you get into becoming a buyer's advocate? Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for having me. I'm from Future Proof Property Advisory. We started our own buyer's agency a year ago. We had built our own property portfolio by buying properties around Australia following data. Mm -hmm. It sounds kind of new age, a bit lame, you're following data, isn't a house just a house? No. So we buy in locations based on supply, demand and a whole host of other indicators that will mm -hmm. show us that an area is ready to grow. Mm -hmm. So why we got into the buyer's agent space is I saw a real gap in the market for authenticity. So what our clients love is that they deal with me directly all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not some shiny shoed, you know, cheap haircut, real estate agent, mm -hmm. leased car, like there's no persona, it's, it's, it's me. So, and what we're trying to do is show people that investing in property is not just for rich people mm. and that the average everyday Australian can invest in property. As you said, I'm a nurse, I work in mm -hmm. intensive care and I had seen people having the worst day of their life every shift mm. and I just really loved helping them through that. But in that it really made me think that life is so fragile and the one thing that we can't get back in life is time. Mm, and the how, most precious commodity, time. 100%. Right. And how can I get the most time with my family mm -hmm. and friends? And the only way that I could see of doing that was to try and leverage the bank's money, invest mm -hmm. in really good assets and try and get a passive income off of property. Mm -hmm. And I actually, like I've um, read a bit into your story and you actually did exactly that. Like I heard that you developed a 3.5 million property portfolio in 18 months, which is incredible. And that's just such a huge achievement. So I would like to say congratulations, because that's Thank amazing. Uh, 3.5 million in um, 18 months is huge. And is that what propelled you also, like you saw the benefit in cash positive flow properties and you wanted to help other people achieve their goals and potentially retire earlier so they can have more time with their friends, family, their kids, go on those holidays, just have passive income and is that another reason why you got into the space as well? Yeah, absolutely. So mm. my partner and I, we always love property. So mm -hmm. uh, we just naturally had a real mind of inquiry around it. So every mm -hmm. night for a year, instead of watching Netflix, we would listen to podcasts, we would and watch YouTube, we would yeah. educate ourselves. Because mm -hmm. I'm really big on taking ownership and agency and accountability for of your course. life. So you can have any circumstance happen to you in life, but it's what you make of it. Mm -hmm. And I feel you know, like I'm a nurse, it's not like we're on crazy wages to get course, into investing. Yeah. Most undervalued, underpaid, um, yeah, uh, industry, I've always said. Absolutely. <laughs> and we work damn hard on the ward. 100%, 12 <laughs> hour right. shifts, yes. night shifts. Exactly. You would have seen a lot of, pe a lot of people through that time. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. you just need to save your deposit for your first property. And yes, if correct. you buy well in the right location at the right time, you can have equity to roll into your next deal. So, 100%. Hmm. And, and in saying that, like in your next deal, what, what would you recommend or what could you tell viewers, mm. where, what areas would you uh, explore in terms of investing? Where's your, I know I've heard that you follow a very precise algorithm mm -hmm. and it's all about data, but where would you look at investing um, or encouraging your clients to invest? Uh, more locally, regionally, interstate, I've, I know there's some 
hotspots or some areas that you really like and you don't have to share all your tips because of course <laughs> you'd be wanting to get yeah a bit more um, keep them secret for your clients but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so if you had um, some areas what what do you think about that like in, uh, interstate investing or um, yeah what's your view on that it's a really good question so you don't have to buy a property in your backyard for it to be successful at the moment within our agency we're seeing really great opportunities in markets like perth townsville rockhampton mm. regional queensland is showing some really strong results yes markets in perth are growing by six percent a quarter wow, that's certain amazing. suburbs only and you have to mm -hmm. remember that this is in a really high interest rate environment that's where there correct. isn't much confidence in the market so yes. What will these markets do when the interest rates drop, mm, which sky, they will at some at yeah. some point? You know, exactly. we're going to see further sustained growth. That's right, and I know that Perth is a town that's over time. People have just called it, you know, the mining town, and and people, yeah, people are referring it to as a mining town. But there's so much opportunity in Perth to invest as an investor, and I, I really think you would agree with that. I would 100%. So the Australian government at the moment is trying to get a lot of skilled workers into the country. Mm -hmm. We unfortunately have a rental crisis. Mm -hmm. Landlords get a, get a bad rap, but without people investing in property, where mm -hmm. would people rent? You know, people exactly. have the idea of a landlord being this... Mm you know, yep. rocking up in a in a Porsche, like I'm a nurse driving a RAV4, you know, and <laughs> like we have a couple of couple of properties and uh, we look after our tenants. It, 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 I think that landlords investing gets such a, a bad rap when, mm. when it shouldn't, you know. Thanks for joining us on the new property show. We hope to have you back soon. Thanks, Michelle. Lucky, welcome to the new property show. It's been a pleasure, uh, pleasure to get you on the show. We've been connected quite a while now on social media. That's how I found you. Uh, but thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure as well. Um, I guess I reached out to you because I saw what you're doing in, I guess, in the construction industry. It's a little bit different. Um, some would think of you like a broker. Some would think of you like a bridge. Uh, I like to think of you, I guess, as maybe a construction broker. I think it's quite a good term, but really what does a construction broker do? Uh, uh, that is a new thing for me as well, because in my industry, I never seen mo most of people doing the same. Uh, you can say I'm a construction broker. Basically, I help my clients to find a right builder for them, uh, depend upon their need, and uh, on their behalf, I work on my client's behalf and deal with the builder, negotiate with them, and discuss on plan, and I educate my client. So basically, I'm a bridge between a builder and a client. Okay, so with your client, um, custom build, what, what size homes are they? Are they 20 squares, 30 squares, 40 squares? You're doing with singles or doubles. Uh, can you give me a couple of examples of what a custom build might look like? Uh, look, again, uh, my, my most of 99% clients are custom. So this it starts from 18 square up to 60 square, whatever. So I design according to their block size. So I, I recommend them as per their block what they should go for. Mm -hmm. So it's depend upon their need and their budget, most important thing. And block sizes um, that I was typically dealing with when I was with the larger builders was 8.5, 10 metre wide, 12.5 metres wide and 14. Uh, what are some of the common sizes you're, you're seeing nowadays? Are you still seeing 40 metre wide, 40 meter wide blocks? Doesn't or? matter. Doesn't yeah. matter at all. If it's a cotton block, it's 8.5 wide or whatever. So we fit the plan because we are I deal with custom builders. We fit the plan as per their block. So we design as a custom design. So I just sometimes I have to sit with the architect and discuss with them how we can design on this odd block. So whatever the block is, we design accordingly. Excellent. And what are some of the common upgrades you're seeing? So uh, typically when I was dealing with, um, with the community, um, some of them needed prayer rooms or they need land room to the front for a meet and greet. Uh, are you still seeing, sort of seeing that sort of come through? Um, second kitchen is that is that something yes, quite yes. common? Yes, 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 it's quite common uh, nowadays. Like everybody wants front lounge, so the guests can come and sit at the front. And second kitchen, some in the alfresco, four m stone, high ceiling, high door. These are the common things. Uh, most probably, they they love to have features like a bulkheads and point things because in my community they they like flashy things. So I fulfil them. 
And big doors, they're still in the 2300 high doors, nice 1200 meter wide, yes, uh, yeah. 1200 millimeters wide. So um, the, I think it's all about the entrance. Yes, yeah. so they love these things. Uh, high, high in our community, like, uh, as I said, they like flashy things. Uh, everything, these things are uh, normal uh, they, now nowadays, but it was uh, mostly builder charges upgrade and they charge a lot. But, uh, but my clients are happy to pay because they love it. What about the porcelain tiles? Are they still going through the house or what, what flooring are you using? Yeah, uh, look, in porcelain tiles, are uh, people love it, but it's some find that is hard to clean and it's very cold in the weather. Mm -hmm. So people love laminate, most mm -hmm. of them, and some kind of upgrade to hybrid as well, but it depends upon what their requirement is. Okay, so dealing with these custom builders uh, and you're getting fixed price contracts for your clients. Look, this is a yeah. challenging for me. Yes. So when clients come to me, I look, I just, first of all, I look the their documentation. I mm -hmm. look the engineering. I look the, if the current block, this comes in bushfire or not. First of all, these things, I no notice all those things and make a list. Then I just sit with them and discuss on the plan. Discuss on the plan, check the land uh, requirements or developer guidelines and all whatever the, on the land is. So I check everything, then I'll go to the builder. So this is the list, this is the inclusion list, this is the plan, this is the special needs on the block. Give me the price. So everything included, then I'll come to the client, okay, look, this is the fixed price, you nothing have to pay, everything is included. What I see in the industry, because I'm in the industry from last seven years, I see most of the builders what they do they give them a price mm -hmm. but the hidden they just keeps on side hidden things like a side cost or the developer requirements they may charge later but i ex i educate my client maybe the price is a bit higher but this is a fixed price everything is included you don't need to pay later on or nothing surprise will come later on so i look after all the things then i'll sign the contract all right, another question there so where are you typically meeting your clients are you going in their home sitting down having dinner or do they come into an office, or how, how does that take place? Look, I have my office in Somerton, mm -hmm. but I give my clients to this facility. If they are not able to come, I go to them, and, mm -hmm. and what they offer, lunch, dinner, I don't mind. It's the best part of the job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that's yeah. the best thing. I sit with them, and uh, as per their need, if they are comfortable to come, or because uh, most of the people, they work in the daytime, and they're free in the evening. And with the kids, sometimes it's hard to travel. So I go to their their home and just discuss on the table. And how long does this process normally take? So if a client was to come in today, uh, how long typically until they're paying a deposit and proceeding ahead with the contract? Look, again, uh, is the process is uh, for the floor plan is mm -hmm. dependent upon how fussy the client is, basically. Mm -hmm. If they're very picky, it will take up to one month to f just finalizing the plan. But if they're okay with the things and they finalize in one go, so maybe two weeks for the plan and after that color selection and the contract, maybe one month processed for throughout. I think the key to this is, uh, is efficiency. So with some of the big builders back in the day, it used to take, um, you pay a deposit and it could take some clients up to four to eight months to receive a contract. Now in that time, there's price increases, um, there's also holding costs on the land, there's also if the contract's wrong, you've got to go back and re-tender. I think it's the most important thing you can do, with, I guess, especially with custom, is get the price fixed as soon as you can. So then you can see, and one of the other things I heard you do is you compare the pricing to what's in the plan. So how much how much time do you spend going Look, through a plan? Look, this is a uh, nervousness in the market, what happened in the past, and people are scared of these things. So even even what I did, I, I tried to fast track the process. If they have a title land or close to title, I try to uh, finish the process ASAP. I push the things, finalize the plan, finalize the contract, and as soon as the contract is finalized, if land is title, I start working on the documentation, and as soon as documentation is fine, finalized, we start the construction. So I push the builder, look, mm -hmm. this is a title block, this is my client, because mm -hmm. it's about relationship with, with my client and with my builders. So I have a personal relationship with the builders, so they can look after me, and I can give a better service to my clients. Okay, so let's just, um, one more question, and I've got another one in mind for you, but Let's, let's talk about the client goes on site. Uh, are you the main point of contact or how does that, uh, the process can be complicated for some people no. with slab to frame, how does that work? Look, again, I try to make the process very simple and easy. Mm -hmm. I'm the best contact for them. If there's any confusion, they can call me and they can meet with me and we can, if they have any, they, if they have to go to site, I can go with them and check the site. If there's any confusion or anything. First of all, my responsibility is to check the plan and a contract and inclusion list. Whatever is in, in the inclusion list must be on the plan. 
plan should match with the specification and specification should match with the plan. So there's no confusion. If something comes up, we can talk to the builder, look, this is the plan, this is the specification, this must be that way. So I look after these things to avoid any confusion later on. I think it's a great service. I, I did speak to a lawyer yesterday that was speaking about, um, she had a friend that was looking to charge up to $2,000 just to do a contract review. Um, and that's without going through and checking out um, the, the inclusions versus that. So I think at the end of the day, it's an added bonus that you're providing that service to not only do the contract review, to make sure the inclusions are right and the pricing. But it brings me to another question though. The construction industry, it's a bit of turmoil for, for a few builders. What confidence do you have going into 2024? Uh, what do you see happening in the market? And will there be more builders continue to fall? Or do you think, um, do you think we're gonna come out of that? Uh, that was really ugly situation in the market, what happened in the mm -hmm. past. Uh, what now I'm seeing is uh, builders are coming back in the market because there's, there's a, uh, enough uh, material available in the market and the most thing is there's a trades is available. Mm -hmm. And I know people get, uh, the most, most or majority people, they get lost in the last year and what happened. But now they are coming back with you know a uh, big boom and they are just trying to push the things because before they charge the price some 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 builders they're giving undercoat mm -hmm. but now they know what's the price in the market they try to give them a what's the best price with their margins on top with good margins and they are i think uh, more uh, sensitive at the moment so they can charge properly, give the better service, better quality. I hope the next year will be very good because our industry is totally dependent on migrants. And as we can see, the migrants are coming a lot. Maybe next year they're coming, I think, a lot We're of almost them. in short supply of housing at the moment because it's a, with 13 interest rate rises, a few people got cautious with building and now at the moment there's, there's an undersupply of, um, of houses being constructed. Look, uh, yeah, as per, in, as you know, the industrial interest rates are getting very high and people, they, before what they happen, in my community, no one, no one want to rent. Mm -hmm. They hate renting. They want to build one, two, three, four houses. Mm -hmm. But now I think they can just stop at two or three. So definitely demand is lesser and availability is more in the mm -hmm. next year. Okay, so how would people normally find you and what advice would you give to a customer watching out here, what they should do next to obviously reach out to you? Uh, look, my clients find me on social media basically, <laughs> on my TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, I post videos all the time. They find me there. And they can, they can. my number is always available on social media, and they can call me anytime. Excellent, well, Lucky, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you so much for coming on. Social media really does work. Uh, here you are. Thank you, it's been a great. Thank, thanks, Steve, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, because today, as you've come in, you may have got a phone call you didn't want to get. Um, something mm. may have annoyed you, and your mindset could be different daily. Now, that's called that's a distraction. Now, a strong mindset will get through that, but there's also emotions there. Mm. Um, Mark, your your version of mindset. Look, I suppose to paraphrase Henry Ford, like whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. It's like you know, you've got to have that underlying belief and you know set goals and see yourself in that future state. Yeah, you know, so there's no doubt that you'll get there. Um, and you know, really, that's you know, that's what it's about. And it's about you know what works for you as well. Like I see people talking about um, you know getting up in the morning and doing things and all that sort of stuff. I'll be very clear, I'm not a morning person. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get stuff done later in the day, but that's what's, that's what works for me. Mm. So it's not about going and buying into what somebody else says the version of success is. It's what works for you, and what's going to get you to that future position. I'd probably just like to just say there is if everyone just got up at 7 a.m. and went bed to 11 o'clock, yeah. nothing would get done. No. Um, <laughs> so we, we need the night owl. Um, mindset for you? For me, I think what I do in order to keep going, uh, I asked a client of mine, a, a very you know, well-known architect in the country, and I said, what does success mean to you? And what's your mindset? He said, success means a continuation of success. You can have success in one project. For example, you can have success in one book. The next book could be down here. But, you know, people are expecting you to elevate from there. Her second book was amazing. So for me, what I do is I listen to audio books and I listen to Les Brown or I listen to Jim Rohn every single morning. Because if I start my day in a positive way, it controls the spirit of the day. And when I'm on the phone, for example, when my client rings me, how's your day going, Zed? 
I go, unbelievable. <laughs> like, why are you doing unbelievable? So positivity feeds positivity. Mm, so 24-7, I'm, po- mm. I'm spreading positive energy to the world out there. Mm. And happy mind, happy body. So mm. then I go, happy body, happy mind, that balance. And mm. then I got asked, a, you know, I did a podcast last week that said, what's the best fashion advice you can give to people? I said, the best fashion advice <laughs> I can give to people is look after your mind yeah. and look mm. after your body. That's true. Because you can just be... You know, an overweight person, with this, there's nothing wrong with it, it makes people happy. Mm. But the reality is, you could wear a Versace top, for example, and mm. be an overweight person, you still need to got some hip, you know, oh, I've got to get rid of that, I've got to get mm. rid of that. <laughs> so then I think the mindset for me, it starts with me believing in myself, working hard on myself, then I can do good on my job, if that makes sense. It starts in the mirror. So, yeah, yeah. Mm. so whatever you reflect, like before I bought my car, I'm like, all right, I've got to have that, you know, in front of me every single day. I wake up, there's my goal there. Mm-hmm. Get up. I put in branding, Z real estate sold. It's branding 24-7 in front of me. You've got to sell something today. Don't go mm-hmm. home. So it's positivity 24-7. Mm-hmm. Listen to something positive. And then surrounding yourself with this type of environment because this room's like mm-hmm. buzzing right now with energy. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Scared to go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so guys, uh, it's, a, it's a really good debate and obviously this is something um, I've really thoroughly enjoyed today. But I'm going to leave with uh, one thing and, and you did kind of give away the segue of um, the word success. Um, so with that, what does the word success mean to you uh, and how would you, um, what's next? So just a quick 20 seconds, word success and what does it mean to you? I'll go with that. So success, I think, is about having the freedom. That's um, yeah, not necessarily a financial thing, although money definitely helps. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the freedom to be able to you know, do what you want, when you want. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but yeah, if you decide you want to you know, take off for a couple of months, go for a couple of months. Okay? Come back, things will still be running. So it's, that's, that's you know, where success is for me. Excellent. Success, there's a worldly success, the conditioned success that people will tell you that you need to have. And whilst that can be fulfilling, being able to discover and awaken deeper deeper levels of awakening within yourself and discover more truth is an infinite realm. So for me, that spiritual success is just as important as any success faced in the real world. And being on the path to that is a privilege. Excellent. So you're saying success beyond imagination and this uh, and this world i love the answer mm-hmm. excellent zed i think success to me means i'm very family orientated you know i wouldn't be where i am without my family so having the family gather gathering around on a sunday uh, and having the blessing of my mum and dad and the family around me that's what success means to me being able to provide for my mum and dad that's been through a lot so my why is my family so my success is my family and if there's two things that we notice here that's significantly different about you, is your brand says one thing, and it's true, but success means another. So your brand is your business, but success is your family, and yeah. that's why you do it, and that's why you have such a good brand. So well done. Excellent answer. Thank you, Steve. That's okay. You're my family too. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> your wife. Um, well, kind of. <laughs> anyway, uh, go green. Um, I think success is a incredibly personal thing and it means something different to everyone but um, for me I think success is a journey and it's infinite it doesn't stop so I think um, having like a vision a dream a goal of where you want to be what you want to achieve what um, in life what you want to do and then successfully achieving that that's something really rewarding and powerful Guys, I want to leave on this closing uh, remark. Success for me is this moment right now. I think it's living in the present. Um, it's relationships that you've built from a long time ago. Mm. It's from a espresso martini <laughs> <laughs> um, and having a discussion late at night with some peers. It's from you and I spending some time together <laughs> and meeting together and getting to know your business and markets for you being a great mentor and friend for over 10 years. But what it's about is bringing people together. It comes back down to the people. So, guys, I'm really, really grateful. It's been a great episode. Um, Really was hoping for a great debate. But I think (laughs) what we did is give a great message. So thank you so much for coming on the New Property Show. Thank Thank you, Steve. Thank Thank you, you, Steve.
That's all for this week and thank you for watching. If you'd like to see our full episodes, please check out our website, thenewpropertyshow.tv. And we'll see you again next week.